I just wanted to introduce myself, Anita Hofschneider. I'm a reporter at Civil B. I'm originally from the island of Saipan, but I've been out here in Honolulu for six years, largely because I have family here. My sisters are in the back. <laughs> um, I wanted to um, go ahead and introduce our panelists, and then we will watch a brief, uh, a brief video a poem by Kathleen Jetnell Kitchener, who is a Marshallese poet about the subject of discrimination in Hawaii. Um, so first I wanted to introduce Sha Ongo um, She is the creator of Hashtag Micronesian. I'm sorry, I meant Hashtag Being Micronesian. And um, she is uh, from, from Palau. Well, actually, she, she's from Oregon, but she's a Palauan activist. Um, here's how she describes herself. Sorry to have you sit here. <laughs> Um, so, Sha Ungo is a Palauan American queer millennial and professional rabble rouser. She spent the better part of the last two decades working in digital media, experimenting with different applications of social media, and her special brand of productive pettiness as a positive force in the community. <laughs> she is best known for her hashtag being Micronesian and her never ending quest to find the best nachos on Oahu. <laughs> Next, I'd like to bring up Arsima Muller. Arsima was born and raised in the Marshall Islands. She moved to Hawaii to attend Maranao High School. Um, she graduated from Boston College with a degree in economics and political science and from George Washington University with her Juris Doctor degree. She's now a partner with the local law firm of Carl Smith Wall. And last, but certainly not least, I would like to bring up Dr. Jojo Peter. <laughs> Dr. Peter is from Atoll Island in Chuk in the Federated States of Micronesia. He is a senior specialist at the Pacific Resources for Education and Learning, working with school engagement projects for Micronesian migrant families of children in Hawaii public schools. He's also a commissioner for the State of Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, and recently appointed to serve on the newly formed Civil Rights Compliance Advisory Committee for the State Department of Education. Jojo is the co-founder and chairman of the COFA Community Advocacy Network. We are Oceania and the COFA Community Leadership and Advocacy Network. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, next, we would like to show a poem by um, a Marshallese poet. Lesson number one. Fucking Micronesian. That's my seventh grade friend. Cussing at those boys across the street, rocking swap meat, blue t-shirts, baggy jeans, spitting a steady beat on that street. Yeah, that one's related to me. You know, you're actually kind of smart for a Micronesian. And that's my classmate who I tutored through the Civil War, through the first immigrants, through a history that always seems to repeat itself. Lesson number two, Micronesians. Micronesians, as in small. Tiny crumbs of islands scattered across the Pacific Ocean, too many countries, cultures no one has heard about, cares about, too small to notice. Small like how I feel. When woman at the salon, delicately tracing white across my nail, stops and says, you know, you don't look Micronesian. You're much prettier. Lesson number three. Prettier as in not ugly like those other Micronesian girls who are always walking by the street smiling rows of gold teeth like they got no shame with hair greased in braided cascading down dirt roads of brown skin down shimmering dresses called guams and neon colored chukis skirts and I can hear the disgust in my cousin's voice. Look at 
those girls. They wear their guams to school and to the store like they're at home. Don't they know? This isn't their country. This is America. See, that's why everyone here hates us Micronesians. Lesson number four. I'll tell you why everyone here hates us Micronesians. It's because we're neon colored skirts screaming different. Different like that ESL kid whose name you can't pronounce, whose accent you can't miss. Different like 7-Eleven, Walmart, Mickey D's, parking lot kickets and fights those long hours, those blue collar nights. Different like parties with hundreds of swarming aunties, uncles, cousins, sticky breadfruit drenched in creamy coconut, coolers of our favorite fish, wheel from the airport, barbecued on a spit, my uncle waving me over. wanted to open up the floor if anybody wanted to um, comment or share you know their responses to that video we'll also have a q a period at the end of this okay so we wanted to kind of start off first by talking about the story that is the reason why we're all here today which is the hashtag being micronesian um, I wrote that article last fall when I was scrolling on Twitter, and I saw that Shaw had actually created a Twitter thread with um, a bunch of screenshots going back for years um, where people were disparaging Micronesians online. So Shaw, I was wondering if you could tell us, you know, what compelled you to save those screenshots and ultimately publish and create that hashtag being Micronesian? Yikes. Uh, so... Saving screenshots is just kind of a thing I do. I guess you could say I'm a digital hoarder. Um, I see things, I think this would make a great uh, reference for a painting, a drawing, I want to write an article about it. It goes in Dropbox and I forget I have it for umpteen years. Um, the reason the thread happened was nachos. Um, I had a rough night, my significant other was at work, it was Friday. I wanted nachos, I was kind of lonely. So I was in a bad mood and I opened up my Facebook app and the first post I saw was um, a post on Stolen Stuff Hawaii about an incident that took place in Kalihi and just comment after comment after comment, um, calling for a purge on Micronesians, saying to get out the raid spray to kill the cockroaches, that we're gonna go hunting for Micronesians after midnight. All the, um, the original screenshots are still on the Twitter thread with names intact. Um, I don't think they made it to the wall, but I was, I was upset and I wanted nachos. And you know there's that moment when you get hangry where there's just no reasoning with you. And so that's where my hanger took me was, you know what, I'm just gonna post everything I have. That's it, I'm, I'm mad, this is what I'm gonna do. And so yeah, nachos and I guess, um, that whole genocidal ethnic cleansing thing. Um, what 
I wanted to have the next question. We'll come back to you, Shah, but the next question is actually for our SEMA. I don't know how familiar everybody here in the audience is with um, Micronesia. It's, and I was wondering, I see if you could share um, just a little bit about the relationship between Micronesia and the US. And what, what are some things that people should know about that history? Um, well, as you can see from the map, uh, Micronesia is Hawaii's closest neighbor. Um, and specifically with respect to its relationship with the United States, it resulted from World War II. Um, we were, they would fight in Japan. A lot of the battles occurred in Micronesia. Um, there's still a lot of sunken ships and planes and stuff there. Um, and after the war, um, the uh, UN took over trusteeship of what you know, what is now the Federated States of Micronesia, um, Palau, and the Marshall Islands, and made the United States the administrator of that trusteeship. Um, and during that time, um, you know, specifically in the Marshall Islands, and I'm not quite so familiar with the other countries, but in the Marshall Islands, um, they conducted a lot of um, military testing, specifically of hydrogen bombs and chemical bombs. Um, I think over 60 of them over the course of 12 years. Um, and then in uh, 1979, the, the Marshall Islands and Federated States of Micronesia became their own countries. They entered into compact of free association with the United States. Palau gets a, a little bit later. And what it basically is is that it allows uh, citizens of these countries to uh, enter the United States and live and reside in the United States, work in the United States uh, without a visa. Um, and um, the United States maintains uh, defense over those countries. Um, it, has, it still has a military installation in the Marshall Islands. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's really the genesis of how it is that we came to be here in specifically in Hawaii and the United States. Thank you so much. Um, Jojo, I was hoping that you could share, you know, as somebody who moved to Hawaii from Micronesia, what are some of the, the challenges that people face when they come here um, from one of those islands? Well, I think uh, many of the challenges are similar with the regular new immigrants and um, when you find, your, you find yourself for the first time. In a, in, in a new place with all of the requirements and and all of the things that you have to go through in order to be able to access uh, you know healthcare education and uh, issues like cultural barriers language access and um, just general I think one of the reason the reason we are here is that general underlying uh, uh, you know concept of uh, you know community and uh, Backlash, backlash against you, and you don't quite understand why. And, but there seems to be a, a lot of strong ill feelings towards you and your presence. Uh, if I may sort of sum it up in the word of uh, one of America's best, I mean, renowned poets and rock and roller, Buffalo Springfield, is uh, there's something happening here, and what it is, it ain't exactly clear. But there's a man over there, you know, pointing the gun and saying, you better be aware. So, you know, you're here, and yet there's a lot of hatred pointed at you, and you don't quite understand why there's such, such strong emotion. So we find ourselves, you know, in a state of sort of perpetual confusion, you and I. But yet we don't seem to understand, or we neglected, the specter of what is beneath and pushing all of these things to the surface, and that is the specter of militarism and colonialism and all of the things that Hawaii ex experienced through its colonial uh, and continues to explore, experience through colonialism, we have that same experience to the point right now where our, one of the islands in Micronesia and uh, Northern Marianas is being proposed to be a target for military uh, bombing. Kind of reminds you a lot of what Kao Olave so when I started going to school here uh, the, in the 90s, I made it a point to understand why the Native Hawaiians were so you know, up in arms with colonialism. 
And then I started realizing that a lot of those histories that was happening back then in the 1890s has a lot of parallels with what's happening after World War II. And there's no, it's not by accident that, um, you know, the United States is very much present in the islands. The Compact of Free Association is actually just sort of further sustenance of that need for the United States military to control. What you see behind us is actually a good, accurate representation of map that is drawn according to the United States interests in the island. So I'm sorry to go to, like take over a little bit of what you were uh, saying, but anyways. So we find ourselves, here we are, and we don't have all the answers ourselves. Uh, we find racism, we find, you know, all of this objectivization by others against us. But we try to, you know, we try to deal with it the best that we can. And I hope that uh, we continue to work together and find those underlying themes where we can, uh, you know, find common ground as people, just people. Thank you. Can you share, Jojo, what are some of your personal experiences with um, these stereotypes in Hawaii, or what have you observed? Excuse me? What sort of um, stereotypes or discrimination have you experienced personally in Hawaii, or what have you observed? Well, I think that wall over there it pretty much sums it up. And all of the news, uh, newspaper and television reporting, uh, people don't understand why, why you're here, or how is it that you 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 compare. <clears throat> There's some misconception that, you know, that we are not paying for anything you know, when we're here. What the truth is, we're actually paying for everything that everybody else is paying for, but we don't have access to what you guys have access to. We pay for health care for you, but we don't have equal access to your health care. We pay all of the other taxes, but we don't have food stamp for those who need it in our, in, in our community, unlike all, uh, everybody else. So there's a lot of that misunderstanding and misconception. So it, it sort of feeds that kind of uh, you know, racism. I think one of the things that has gone hashtag, uh, I mean, has gone viral lately is that uh, eradicate Micronesian uh, banner. That's on, on sort of, it's on uh, social media right now. So people have sort of taken that up. And my, my issue has always been that if there is a lot of these structural discrimination or structural barriers against you that starts with the government and the state government and the federal government and it filters down to the community and it's all crashing in on you, you have very little recourse. And we need the help of those people who want to understand because we've been to the legislature, we've been to the Congress every year and trying to ask for a little bit, just a little bit. We're not fighting for something special. We're just asking, can you please fund these people who have zero income, but you're pushing them onto the Obamacare and they keep falling out, out of the uh, coverage because they don't have money to pay for the premiums. And yet, people think that you have somehow, you know, they are taking over these programs. So there's a lot of that misunderstanding. There's a lot of issue. There's a lot of issue with uh, language barrier. And although it is the law, that language access is one of those laws that the state of Hawaii makes sure that they, also, that the state also has a strong language, language access law. And yet, many a times, especially during the healthcare fight in the early uh, 2010 and so on, many times, the state of Hawaii violated its own law to try to get pushed through the basic uh, health of Hawaii. And that goes to show you know, that even the state of Hawaii has gone out of its way to discriminate against the micronesia. And that filters down to you know, the community and to the school. What Jojo is referring to is a very long um, policy debate um, over funding Medicaid for um, people who are citizens of the Federated States of Micronesia or Palau or for the Marshalls. And so when the COFA agreements were first uh, created, um, when immigrants came here, they, were, they would be eligible for those safety nets if they weren't unable to work or then, and they needed to rely on them. But back in 1996 with the Welfare Reform Act, 
um, Congress decided to cut off funding for those programs. And for a while, um, the state of Hawaii did pick up the slack and was funding those programs. But back in 2009, um, the Lingle administration uh, temporarily switched uh, a bunch of uh, COVID migrants off of Medicaid and onto a much uh, more stringent, limited health care plan. Um, and what it did is it said that, oh, you could only have go for a set number of visits per year. And this was really devastating to people who were on dialysis or chemotherapy or, or had um, really uh, continuous health care needs. And so there was a lawsuit. And so what subsequent administrations have done was shift um, COPA migrants onto Obamacare. And like he said, um, we've reported on the sort of challenges that people from that uh, low income bracket have affording Obamacare uh, co-payments at that level because if they're the type of people on the, the, that income level who would normally uh, be eligible for Medicaid, but because they're here um, through the COPA agreements, they are not. Um, I wanted to go back to Shaw and ask, you know, to tell us a little bit more about your personal experiences being Micronesian here in Hawaii. You know, what sort of experience have you had with these stereotypes or what have you observed? It's, it's been strange. Um, now, I've been here since the end of 2016, but prior to that, I lived here um, 2001 to 2002 for my first year of college. It was horrible, and I vowed never to return, um, but a job opportunity and true love brought me back, so here I am. Um, but my first time here, and I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, which is, uh, at the time, was a 93, 94% white, city, state, area. Um, if you know anything about the history of Oregon, it was founded as a whites-only state. So to say that diversity isn't really commonplace in Oregon is kind of an understatement. So my senior year of high school, I said, I don't care what school I go to, whoever is the first college counselor from the state of Hawaii who shows up at my school, I'm going to their school. And so it happened to be a private Catholic university here in Honolulu. And I went there for my first year and it was, on one hand, it was kind of the most exciting experience of my new adult life, but it was also the most miserable. Um, on one hand, I had never been in school with brown students, and it was amazing. I loved it. I blended in. Nobody singled me out. People mistook me for their own relatives, and I didn't think that was even possible. So I, I felt like I was normal, which when you're in your teens, doesn't happen. Um, so that was amazing and I loved it. At the same time, um, because I'm Palauan American rather than Palauan from Palau, I had a difficult time um, kind of making my way, integrating into my actual Palauan community. Um, I am an anomaly. It's very uncommon for Palauan Americans, anyone born outside of Palau, to grow up speaking the language, and I did. No one knew that. So it was a lot of Palauans talking about me, but in front of me. And that wasn't really good for the self-esteem. So I had a hard time kind of getting to know my own Palauan community. At the same time, I grew up in Oregon where there were so few Micronesians or Islanders in general, that Islanders were just Islanders in Oregon. One weekend, all of us would go to a Tongan function, but then Sunday, don't forget, there's a Marshallese picnic after church. So like everyone would just go, that was how the 80s was. There was maybe three dozen families that just everyone knew each other. Um, that wasn't the case here, so I was confused. Um, the Palauan group didn't necessarily accept me, but the Micronesian group was fine, and I identified initially as a Micronesian growing up. It was, you're Micronesian if they ask, you're Palauan, just to be specific. So. I found my spot, I found my place, I was comfy, I was in school, I was a broke college kid eating Zippy's chili every day. And then I found out that nobody liked my social group. Um, I went and applied for my first job, which was, I think, Thinker Toys at Kahala Mall, and that was in 2001. And the first piece of advice my cousins gave me, okay, but whatever you do, don't tell them you're Micronesian. Like, what? Like, no, you can tell them you're from Oregon. If they really press it, say you're Palauan. If they ask you if you're Micronesian, explain that Palau is different. Because they'll never hire you. Why? Well, because, you know, what people say. What do people say? They don't say that about Micronesians where you're from? No, we're just islanders. If anything, they like us. We have food. 
So that was my first kind of experience seeing how this really worked, what the dynamic was if you were Micronesian in Hawaii. Um, and just, it was so much to take in socially that being a normal 18 year old wasn't enough to keep me here. I left and didn't come back uh, for 10 years. And I, it was like passing through, I didn't stay. But I came back in um, the end of 2016 thinking, you know, 15 years has gone by. We've grown, we've evolved as people. We're smarter, we're better. Wow, was I wrong. Um, no, nothing had changed. I mean, the biggest change I saw was people were a lot more casual in how they would be derogatory. Um, and it, it, it was something in the schools now. It was in schools, it was things that people reported on in healthcare. It was something people talked about, like, try not to tell people how many relatives you have. Don't let on that you're Micronesian when you apply for the apartment. Like, do you, can you mark yourself as something else? Are you something else? No, I'm just, sorry, that's all, that's all I got. But it, it was normalized. Like, if you're Micronesian, we can make fun of you, and it's normal. They, they have these things online that people say, they make the jokes on the radio. Um, I've seen videos on YouTube, videos on other things, but it's, it's normal. And um, one of the screenshots on the wall is a picture of a cockroach and it says something along the lines of, I have nothing but disdain towards Micronesians and their community. And that is an individual who used to work as a teacher's assistant at Farrington. Um, he is not the only educator who made it onto the thread. Educators, people who work in healthcare, and if you think that children, or even adults, don't feel that your teacher looks down on you, your doctor doesn't think you're really human, you can feel that. So that's been my experience coming back. Thank you, Shaw. Arsima, I was wondering if you could share what you've observed here, too. Um, well, uh, I, like what Kathy was saying on her poem, uh, I get, you know, the question of, are you, are you really Micronesian? Because I, I mean, my background is I'm a product of colonialism that occurred in the Marshall Islands. My last name is Muller, obviously German, and my, uh, my grandfather and my mother's side is Japanese. So it is, you know, I am a walking history of the Marshall Islands. So I do, but I don't look what people typically think of uh, what Micronesian would look like. Although both of my parents are Marshallese, um, and I was born and raised there. Um, when I first moved here for high school, uh, that was over 40, 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't actually that much out about um, people in Micronesia or even the Marshall Islands. The typical question I got was, "Where is that?" Even though it's the closest, it's like close, it's basically the same distance as to California. Um, but uh, people did not know where that was. People didn't, there weren't really stories out there about Micronesians or anything. There weren't really a lot of us really, I think, back then. Um, uh, so it's, uh, you know, that was high school. I moved away for, for school and I came back. Um, and it's, it's definitely much more noticeable now, and you know my cousins, you know, look what people think a typical Indonesian look like. They get treated differently than I do, um, and I like even in the legal field, I hear attorneys speak about those dang Micronesians, and I have to be like, um, I'm one, you know. So and and then I get the oh really you don't look like it or really or you're actually speak articulate and I was like you know so it's 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 you know my personal experience is probably not typical of what you know others get to face but it's it's definitely noticeable and um, uh, I, I see my family members go through it on on a daily basis so it's unfortunate I wanted to turn the conversation or you know, what is sort of being done to combat these stereotypes. And I know, Arsima, you've done a lot in the, within the Marshallese community to try to uplift the community. Could you tell us about that? 
Um, sure. So I think, you know, the problem is that when you go into a conversation with a preconceived notion, you're always going to try to find examples that support or justify, you know, your preconceived notions. And that's sort of, I mean, I do that on, uh, in my work. So I understand that. Um, and what we've been trying to do is try to show that there's more to Micronesians uh, than what's, what's you know, in your preconceived notions already. Um, I am uh, on the board with WOW. Uh, I, um, I am on the board with Legal Aid, um, you know, I, which serves a lot of Micronesians. So I try to get involved in you know, these um, organizations that serve the community. Um, I'm also uh, I'm up on the planning committee that every year we put on a, an event for the Marshallese students to try to honor their, you know, if they got on the honor roll or, you know, to try to lift up those sort of examples um, to show that we're, not, we're more than just what's you know, on the board, what people, the, those notions that people put out. So we're just trying to change the narrative in our favor. Great. Jojo, I know that you've also done a lot of work with WOW and with Copacan. Could you tell us a little bit about sort of what you've been doing to uplift the community? Yeah, and I think that that's that misconception that you know what what are you what have you guys done about it? And actually, we've done more than those people who were supposed to do something about it. Because more often than not, they look to us and say, "Oh, they are your people, so you do volunteer work to fix it." And we have done like beside our full-time jobs, we have volunteered to put together organizations like Marshallese Education Day, very awesome. Every year, come and see them. This year, we're at the at Harris Church of Anuanu. And we also have, we are Oceania. Very recently, like what, four, four, five, four years ago, we created We Are Oceania, sort of like a one-stop center, a one-stop center for uh, people who need healthcare issues, I mean, health issues who need to take care of issues for health and any other, you know, access to you know, the social services programs. Um, we have a uh, COFA community advocacy network where we do policy, uh, draft policy and do uh, legislative, uh, you know, advocacy. And recently we created a national grassroots COFA or Micronesian uh, uh, group called uh, COFA Community Leadership or Leadership and Advocacy Network. And we've met uh, twice next week. We're going to meet in Utah, where we have people from Arkansas, from Texas, from uh, uh, Arizona, Cal uh, California, uh, Oregon, and here in Hawaii. Where we we're looking at uh, pushing for uh, changes at the you know at the federal level. With, with doing we do outreach with congressional leadership, and you know do awareness among so. And every every year we go to the legislature and we do you know walk uh, you know door to door knock and you know let them know that we have uh, you know these uh, citizens. So in actual actuality, we have done a lot every, uh, throughout each year. That, uh, we, oh yeah, that's right. And uh, this is the first time that we're going to have the Micronesian Cultural Festival at the Bishop Museum this month. I mean next month, May 11th. Please mark your calendar. Uh, it's going to be at the Bishop Museum, and every year we put on that Micronesian festival as a way to reach out to uh, the larger community. Because and our point here is, we are we are part of the community. You know, as much as all of these, you know, legislation and all of that, we're not trying to isolate us and define us separate to separate our identity from. But we are part of this community, so we do as much as we can to, to contribute to. Thank you. Thank you, Jojo. Um, before we go to the questions, I just want to go back to Shaw. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, was there anything else you'd like to add, Shaw, about the work that you've been doing and what you know, sort of what you think can be done to combat these stereotypes? Um, I actually volunteer with both the groups they mentioned. Um, uh, I do work with WOW. I was involved with the Micronesian Youth Summit this year which had, I think it was nearly 400 Micronesian youth, and that was beautiful. Like, as the kid, like, my inner child from Oregon who was like, I just want to be with brown people. Like, that was the coolest thing I had seen. I, like, went into, like, kid mode with that. Um, I, for my intro, so 
I use digital media and different forms of media to try to um, do advocacy and activism. So I podcast, I create um, infographics, editorial cartoons, which occasionally get me in trouble. Um, I, I pretty much will go like do anything if I think that there would be a benefit to it. I mean, I'm, I'm a professional rabble rouser. I just kind of want to make people angry and notice things and, and feel things. So with the podcast, that's definitely taken off. Um, my friend who's in the crowd here, Adam, he uh, helped, he, we co-founded two nonprofit organizations. So we have Indigenous Pacifica, which is to help, it's part of the podcasting, it's using media to get those voices out there, to give um, Indigenous Pacific people from the Pacific Rim an opportunity to really speak about the issues that pertain to them, give them a platform that's theirs, that they can, that they don't feel limited in what they can say. Um, we also have Progressive Pacifica, which is a 501c4, because we would love to see more civic engagement on the Pacific Islander side. I mean, there's, I've done a lot of work that occasionally gets me in trouble um, about the API or AAPI umbrella, Asian Pacific Islander, because there is a tendency there for erasure of Pacific Islanders, um, whether you're Micronesian, Melanesian, or Polynesian. Um, and I do a lot of work talking about the Solomon Report and the 1972 CIA memo called The Problem with Pacific Independence. And those are two government issue documents that are basically blueprints and instruction manuals for how to get the Micronesian region to self-colonize. So, um, in the event that you want to read either of those documents, I actually built a whole website around them, and that is called transparency.pw. .pw? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to open up the floor to questions, if anybody would like to... Um, All right, I mean, as, as far, I cannot speak on behalf of the Marshall Islands, uh, uh, RMI, but I know for the FSM, the group, uh, the group that is putting together the report, sort of like a summary report of, on the compact, I think recently are, are, will, or if they haven't yet, will be turned to, into the negotiating group with the United States, and they are meeting with uh, groups on the mainland right now, and they're coming through here within the next week or so. And throughout their meetings with uh, in the States, one of those things that always come up is the issue of the disparities of the healthcare and the promise of the, of the open immigration. You can't come in, but once you come in, then what's the point of going in if you're not eligible for all of the, you know, the, or if you're not treated fairly, uh, although you participated on the you know, contributing side. So you're contributing, but you're not getting much out of your contribution. And that has to be fixed because it's sort of, it, it is an unfair playing field for the Cuba citizens, <coughs> finding themselves sort of uh, treated unfairly. And for the state of Hawaii, and that has to be looked at very, very carefully because uh, I think this, the federal government tends to disagree with the, with the state's you know, analysis of what the actual impacts are. And if you remember, uh, Accord, I mean, along with the Compact of Free Association, after they negotiated the Compact of Free Association, they, there's that impact law that they, they, the Congress approved on an annual basis for the juri any jurisdiction within the states <coughs> for, to the federal government and estimate, an estimate amount for, for impact and that the federal government will reimburse that. And that has never been you know, agreed upon at, at any level that that's meaningful to both sides. But also, when you say the compact of free association is up, it's actually just the direct funding to the, to the, to the governments of RMI and FSM. Money that goes directly from the, uh, the, from the federal government to them. As far as everything else remains the same, including, most prominently, the United States military interest is never touched. So if that ex exists pretty much in perpetuity, 
while all the other things that FSM and the Marshall Islands were getting from the, uh, from the United States has actually gone away now. And so it further drives the wedge on that disparity between the parties on what they're getting out of this deal. So for us, the compact has not worked well. And it will further be so even worse after 2023. So our point is this. Many of our citizens have taken on themselves to fix the problem that the colonial, the colonial uh, I mean, the trust territory period failed to fix healthcare, education, economic opportunity back home. Those were, those were promises of the trust territory. Until now, it hasn't been you know, taken care of. So the Micronesians themselves took upon themselves to come to the United States and find those opportunities for themselves. That has to be recognized. And yet, what's happening now is sort of the reverse. You know, we're sort of like damning these people for, you know, taking on the promise of that relationship by, for themselves. So I think, you know, meetings like this and meeting with the organized, I mean, with, with, the, with the negotiating groups will be very important, uh, you know, for public awareness. So. Thank you, Jojo. Does anybody else have any other questions or, or comments that they would like to share with the group? Thank you very much for whatever you said today. Um, as far as preconception, is there different ethnic groups in Hawaii have shown more or less preconception or equally uh, every ethnic group have shown toward the Panawan and Marshallese and uh, other island of Micronesia, the same attitude. Is the question, is a question. The, the ethnicity of the people yes. making the statements? Yes. I can speak based on just like the screenshots and the encounters I have. And I should probably clarify that my personal experience is very similar to Arsima's. People in the Micronesian community don't tend to realize that I'm one of them. So outside of that, a lot of people will discuss or talk ill of Micronesians in front of me. And it's not until I step in and go, oh, hey, by the way, um, my mom and dad are Palau, that they kind of go, oh, but you're different, right? Like, no, no, I'm still Micronesian. Um, so you can go to the Twitter thread. It's um, hashtag being Micronesian. It's, uh, the ad is Sha underscore Marie Ray. But you'll notice that um, for the screenshots, it's, pretty, it's a little bit of everybody. It's, I think it's less the ethnicity of the people making the comments, but you can definitely see it's an education level, it's it's an openness. Um, the people who make those comments tend to be people who just don't care to learn. Yeah. They're not, you can put the information in front of them and it wouldn't matter, because they don't want to know. It's they're <coughs> just in their own worlds and that's fine with them. And honestly, that's fine with me. I'm not here to change people's minds. Um, I should also explain, I'm the daughter of a man who protested the Compact of Free Association. Um, my heroes growing up were my uncles who all fought against the Compact because they did not believe that it would benefit us in the long run. They did not like the idea of the United States essentially trying to corner us into self-colonizing. Uh, they didn't believe free association was free association, and I think in the years since we've kind of realized that it's not. So. Um, that's kind of my, my thing is I'm, I'm here to present information and if people are interested in hearing more, I would love to be able to speak with them and mobilize my allies. But if you don't care about the information, that's cool too, because there's nothing I can do to help you. Thank you. Honestly, there was no audience. It was, um, if I post something on Twitter when I'm hungry, it's probably my sister's. I really, I didn't think it would be interesting to anyone besides my sisters who know how I am when I'm upset and I just kind of run with the thing. Honestly, I have Anita to thank because she contacted me, I think the day after 
about um, all the screenshots. And in hindsight, I guess it's not common for someone to just sit there and hoard screenshots about one particular thing for years. But in my case, I don't hoard just that. It's just I had a lot of them. So um, yeah, it, it wasn't really, I wasn't trying to start a movement. I wasn't trying to make a point. I was upset. Um, I was having a rough night. And that was the first thing I saw on Facebook. I, I go into Facebook because I want to see pictures of my nieces and my nephews, and I want to see stories about puppies being reunited with their owners. And, and the first thing I saw was, pardon my language, but fuck these Micronesians, let's purge them all. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to say is um, there's an assumption there that that hasn't happened in our communities. There's an assumption that our parent, like, the parents who are watching their kids doing these things aren't horrified by the children who are doing these things. Um, and it's one of the things I notice online when it comes to the screenshots is people say, where are the parents? The parents are working three, four jobs each trying to keep their homes together. Um, the children do sometimes get stuck fending for themselves, but that assumption that the parents don't care somehow or that there's no adult involvement, most situations there is. Um, I can't speak for the Marshallese community or any of the FSM islands, however I can say that in the Palau community we don't have a godfather. Um, if we were in Palau, we have, uh, we have our clan elders, we would have village elders, we have paramount chiefs, but I mean, that doesn't translate to differently from saying in our community we have the homeowners association, the, uh, the city council, the state legislature. It's, there's no magical formula or magical sacred islander way that we would handle these things here. This is just as new for a lot of the families here as it is for anyone else. And if this helps kind of put things into perspective, so imagine being colonized by three radically different nations in the course of 100 years and what that does to a person's psyche, what that does to your culture, what that does to you. And in the course of that 100 years, you have so many generations, and then you have to leave home to go elsewhere. You're dealing with so much, so much in terms of trying to remember who you are and, and not assimilate, because when you assimilate, you lose things. So we try to acculturate, we try to acclimate, but to suggest that somehow our parents aren't involved, our parents aren't stressing out, our parents aren't absolutely horrified that some of our kids, our cousins, our nieces, our nephews went out there and did something that really did make us look bad and we understand it. That's, that's a really big jump and honestly it's a little hurtful. I, I just want to say that I'm not aware of any other culture being asked to be accountable for the acts of their kids. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just not aware of that. So you make that statement, but I'm not aware of any. Um, kids, I mean, there are bad apples, as with every culture, there are bad apples. And I'm sorry that, you, I don't know if you had an experience, a bad experience with, with what you just described. I mean, I don't have any kids, but I apologize. I mean, I don't know what, that I should be apologizing, but I'm sorry that you had that experience. We can take one more question. Well, first of all, thank you so much for um, uh, the opportunity to learn from each one of you about the Micronesian community, or you know, more specifically, or politically correct FSM, Marshallese and Palauan communities. So thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, I've worked with students at Shamanat University. So one of the guys who spoke, uh, he, I, he was in my class, in my MBA class. Um, so I know that uh, Micronesian community 
is just amazing and awesome. Um, what I want to ask is what can we as the community do to help and support you folks? You can call your Congress people. I mean, I can do that. More than happy to do that. Um, I just tell people to be open. Be willing to learn, be willing to understand. Um, yes, there are people who've had bad, bad experiences with Micronesians. I'm from Oregon. I have been called every racial slur I can imagine. I have been profiled, I have been stopped by police for standing. I have a pretty <coughs> profound fear of law enforcement because of where I grew up. I'm not gonna demonize every white person in this room, so. I, I realize that, um, and that's really all I ask from everyone else. Like, I'd like to think of myself as a human, and so I treat everyone else like humans, and I feel like if we could all just kind of get that part down, that's a really good start. More, sounds like the Alanis is one more. Thank you for uh, the presentation. And uh, from the point of view of the public, uh, myself, I'm confused too about the complexity of the problem, not only the doctor, but uh, I admire all the work you've been doing as an individual and as an organization. What I'm trying to sort out for myself is uh, some of these issues that deal uh, simply with uh, civic norms to get together with each other. Other are US civil rights that are very specific and very legal, and the other are broader human rights, almost international. And uh, I'm wondering what we can do from the general public to, to understand which of these three levels of concern we can address, because some United Nations some U.S. federal government, some the, the state, some is the county, some are, are the, the churches and the schools and so on. Thank you. Um, I think so, you know, our most direct um, engagement with the United States is through the compact and that's a federal document, that's a federal agreement um, we, you know, the United States, it's really a, a strategic asset. We are having, the, you know, these countries in the, in the Pacific Ocean, um, you know, I hear a lot about people say, you know, well, what do they give us? It is really, this is a strategic wall against China, against what, when it first started against Japan. So, uh, and you, the United States still has you know, rights that it can veto us on, you know, our, when we make agreements with countries. And it, you know, it really is big brother to us. Um, and I think that is really the most direct thing that would have, you know, have a more, you know, uh, you know, the, the most uh, impact on us is really our agreement and as, Someone mentioned it is up for renegotiation, although all of it, most of it is economic. Um, but, you know, like I think someone shouted out, um, reach out to your um, legislators. Uh, I think they have been trying to, there have been some efforts to try to bring back Medicaid. You know, I pay taxes just like everyone else, but God forbid something happened to me, I couldn't access Medicaid. I couldn't access, you know, the safety net um, stuff. Um, so, what am I, you know, it's, it's, and they're, they're supposed to be a safety net for everyone who pays taxes. I pay cash, but I can't do that. None of us can. So um, I think that would have the most direct impact on us. I think you gotta, like, feed up what the, I should have said. And to truly understand um, the, I mean, how much control uh, the United States has on this country. It basically has control over all of its land, its air, and its waters. 
and how we negotiate with outside forces. So basically, we, we have very little leverage in terms of if, it, if anything has to do with coming against the United States uh, uh, military interest. Uh, the wild card here is recently has been China. Because China has put in a lot of money in, 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 the, in, the, in the region. Recently, they just built this huge government building for the state of Chuk in the Federated States of Micronesia. And now they're looking at building a new hospital. Things that haven't been accomplished under the Compact of Free Association. Now, I know China's building all of this, but sooner or later they're going to you know, start you know, asking for support and leverage from all of the regional, and that's gonna like, put you know, things in a sort of a tailspin in terms of you know, where this, and recently one of those things that the Chuk state government has sort of articulated, not them, but those people who supported the secession movement is, you know, we're really not getting anything up as much as we thought we would under the Compact of Free Association. But to get to your point about the, the I think at the most basic core of all of this is we have to respect each other's human rights and the right to exist like everybody else. And I think if we can't just commit to being open-minded to support the humanity of the person across from you, regardless of national, nation, I mean, national origin and the other protected classes, I think that's a very good start. And to be, shame, uh, to be shameless, I wrote a book. I don't even tell you anything about fixing the problem, but it is a very good book. <laughs> really basic uh, local level in terms of involvement, donate to organizations that do advocate for the rights of Micronesians, whether it's the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii or We Are Oceania. Those are both nonprofits, and they both do an amazing amount of work for the Micronesian community here. Um, also, look into, because I don't want to I want Jojo to be the only shameless one here. Uh, also look into Indigenous Pacifica, Progressive Pacifica, and if you want to learn more about um, what it is that we are for the United States in terms of uh, FSM, RMI, and the Republic of Palau, um, at transparency.pw there is a document and it's a CIA memo titled The Pacific, uh, Problem with Pacific Independence. And it literally spells out what each island is in terms of um, a piece of military strategic land, militarily strategic land. Um, it explains why they need to keep the Marshall Islands, why each island is strategic. It explains what each part of the Federated States of Micronesia does for them. And it explains why they can't give up possession of these islands for defense purposes. Um, and then keep that in mind when you remember that um, either of them, my parents, if they should for some reason need to tap into their SSI benefits, that will never happen. Social security. Yeah, social security benefits, uh, social security, uh, food stamps, um, I believe workers' comp, all the things. Um, and legal aid is, has, I, they've had to tell people when they come in saying that I'm disabled or I got hurt at work. And can, can you imagine telling someone like, oh, you've worked here for 13 years and you're now a senior citizen, but yeah, you don't qualify for any sort of retirement. It's like, that's, that's rough. So yeah, if you can donate to those organizations, please do. You could also keep reading Civil Beat. Senators <laughs> 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 keep letting me write about this topic. <laughs> um, you know, Jojo mentioned uh, the bombing of an island called Pagan in uh, the Mariana Islands. We didn't talk very much about the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, where I'm from, but it's on that map there, and it's also a part of Micronesia. And they also, you know, the U.S. also has a lot of military interests there. So I, we just did a story a few weeks ago about um, accepting public comments to continue doing undersea sonar training in the region and to continue bombing an island that's already been a bombing island there for several decades. Um, so you can, there are opportunities to public comment, uh, to comment uh, on those types of military plans. Um, but yes, thank you all very much for coming. Um, we really appreciate your interest in this topic. And thank you
Dr. Drew for being here today. Before we end our program tonight, we just want to bring on We Are Oceania to join us for a little dance. Thank you.